LinkedIn presents. Welcome to The Next Big Idea. I'm Rufus Griscom. Have you ever been brought to tears by a TV commercial? Do you relish rainy days? Are your favorite songs sad ones? If you answered yes to any of those questions, then you, my friend, know the power of the bittersweet. It's a feeling, an emotion, a way of being that Next Big Idea Club curator and my dear friend Susan Cain explored in her number one New York Times bestseller, Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole. I spoke with Susan about the book in April 2022, and it remains one of my favorite conversations that we've had on this show, certainly one of the most moving. So today we're sharing it again. I hope it gives you goosebumps. Hi, I'm DC Marshall. Hi, I'm Mita Malik. We are the co host of the Brown Table Talk podcast, where we discuss how to help women of color thrive in their workplaces. And we invite allies to join us to help women of color win at work. We have a seat waiting for you. Subscribe to Brown Table Talk wherever you enjoy podcasts. I'm Rufus Griscom, and this is The Next Big Idea. Today, Susan Kane on loving sad songs, the problem with normative sunshine, and embracing the power of the bittersweet. My freshman year of college, I fell in love for the first time. Liz, head over heels puppy love. I skipped around campus, floated, lungs full of helium. Sophomore year, she ended it. I remember lying on the floor of the shower, water running, crying, heaving for what felt like hours. This, I thought, is what bedrock feels like. Maybe when I run out of tears, I can build something on this. That moment was, I think, the beginning of my adulthood to some degree. It was a birthing. It hurt. It felt like it very nearly killed me, but it didn't. And in the months that followed, it made everything sharper, brighter, colors more saturated. And what a discovery that was. Sadness, it turned out, was useful. It made me want to write, think, connect. Just as traders who sold stocks short could make money when the market went down, it was possible, I now realized, to extract beauty from pain. Before that crucible experience, my greatest insecurity, this is gonna sound weird, maybe a little pretentious, was that I hadn't experienced enough pain. I went to Brown, an artsy school. My friends fancied themselves aspiring writers, literary critics, thespians, artists, and I was aware that I was missing something. I knew pain, sadness, and longing were critical colors on the palette of the artist, necessary ingredients in the alchemy that rendered the beautiful, the sublime. I was in short supply until I wasn't. My friend Susan Kane, our guest today, was walking around Princeton at the same time in the late 1980s. She had a different set of problems. In her new book, Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole, she describes her experience this way. Princeton, for better and for worse, was the exact opposite of my childhood home. Its students landed and nonchalant. The campus was populated with classmates who possessed a physical grace I was wholly unacquainted with. Narrow hips, strong limbs, glossy streams of blonde hair. She adds, Everything and everyone shimmered. There was only one blot on this exalted landscape. The telephone in my dorm room, linking me inescapably with my mother. As Susan's freshman year wore on, the pain of separating from her mother and from her past grew more acute. If in high school we had followed a repeating pattern of separation and reunion, now the mother of my childhood had simply vanished. In her place was a vengeful woman who telephoned daily with accusations of malfeasance. It reached the point where Susan admits that had her mother been struck down by a 10-wheel truck or a swift and incurable disease, she would have been devastated, but also a little bit relieved. There would have been funeral rituals. There would have been a language for the pain, a way for others to understand it. As it was, 
It never occurred to me to mourn her. Who would think to grieve a mother who was pulsatingly alive and daily appearing Gorgon-like at the other end of a dorm room telephone? This was Susan's cross to bear. It felt then like an isolated experience. She would come to realize, though, in the years that followed, that everyone experiences loss or will. And through this common experience, we are connected to each other and to the sublime. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a pioneer in near-death studies, said, the most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These persons have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. Susan Cain is among the most beautiful people I know and among the wisest. I'm not alone in this view. Her book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Won't Stop Talking, was a book that made a dent in the world. It increased the general storehouse of empathy towards the quieter among us. We are lucky to have Susan among the four curators of the next Big Idea Club. In her latest book, Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole, Susan shares her roadmap to the beautiful, the sublime, the bittersweet in all of us. Susan Kane, welcome back to the next Big Idea podcast. Rufus Griscom, it's so great to be here with you. Well, first of all, Susan, how are you? How, how's your, your book tour going? Oh, gosh. Well, <laughs> I'm doing really well. Uh, we are recording this in that strange moment of days before my book is going to come out. And, um, you know, it's been a really long time since I've been in this mode because Quiet came right. out quite a while ago. Yes, yes. Um, and so I'm recognizing all the different experiences of it all. Like the first week that I was out there talking about it publicly, I yeah. had to go through my obligatory week of suffering where <laughs> yeah. I was like really nervous about it. And I wasn't quite sure how to talk about the book. And I actually had a little glass of rum with me, like right, <laughs> right right, on hand for every interview. But I will say now I'm speaking to you only with coffee and no rum. So wow. that's well, the that's, progression. That's that's one of the benefits or maybe liabilities of having the 10.30 a.m. slot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I was doing it for the 10.30 slot, too, oh, even okay. at the beginning. Right. Yeah. Well, Susan, I so enjoyed your book. I've been deep in the bittersweet for a couple of weeks now. And may, arguably, I've been deep in the bittersweet for 54 years now. <laughs> and if you can believe it, Susan, I've done almost 100 interviews for this podcast in the last couple of years. And many of the books that I've read in the process have, have changed me, like changed the way I live my life. But none of them have caused me to cry as many times <laughs> as, as your book, Bittersweet, did. None have been more full of love and compassion for all of humanity. So thank you for turning me into a puddle. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, I mean, thank you for... Thank you for saying all that. This is making me wonder, you must have taken the bittersweet quiz that I have at the beginning of the book. And I'm curious, how you scored on that? I was pretty off the charts. You know, certainly questions like, do you feel goosebumps multiple times a day? <laughs> and, then, and are you uh, struck by, by the beauty of, of small things? Like that's, I was sort of 10 out of 10 in that department. And actually, I, I picked up from a friend a habit of lifting my right arm and sharing with friends, look, goosebumps, <laughs> to, just to share that sort of visceral experience of beauty, because it is just such a powerful thing. And it's a physical thing. Sorry to interrupt you, but it's so funny that you do that, because I find myself multiple times a day writing in emails, goosebumps, goosebumps, like I'm having goosebumps right now at what you just said. It's like, not only do you feel them, but there is this need to communicate how yes. moved you've been by something. Yes, exactly. Exactly right. And that's, and that's one of the great things about physical presence, right? <laughs> right. That is true. Actually, see, you know, see the goose mouth. Um, maybe we should start with the broad thesis of the book and, and, and why you wrote it. Yeah. So this book was basically a five-year, or maybe more than five years, you know me, um, five-year quest to grasp the power of a bittersweet and even a melancholic way of being. And what I learned is that the bittersweet tradition spans centuries, it spans continents, and that it teaches us that we are creatures who are born to transform pain into beauty. 
I'll say that our feelings of bittersweetness, um, they are some of the greatest gateways that we have to states of creativity and connection and love. And we live in this culture that doesn't really like to talk about these kinds of emotions of sorrow and longing and poignancy. Uh, they're seen as vaguely distasteful. And that is, it's a real shame because it's cutting us off from some of the best parts of ourselves. Yeah, I, I love your phrase. Longing is a sacred and generative force. It's really almost a human superpower, which you point out is at odds with our culture of normative sunshine. Yes. Yeah, we, we do live in that kind of culture. And when, when you hear the word longing, if you ask me, quick, quick, what word do you associate with the word longing? I would say mired. You know, like mm, you think yeah. mired and longing, or like you might mm -hmm. be wallowing in it. But if you look at the etymology of the word longing, it literally means to grow longer, um, to reach for something. Mm, and no. one of the things I did with this book is really explore what our artistic and wisdom traditions have been telling us about these states of mind for the last centuries. And the, the message of all these traditions is that the state of longing is actually what propels us to astonishing acts of creativity and of love. And there've been many words for longing. So like in ancient Greece, the word was, was potos, which mm -hmm. meant kind of like the longing for that, which is unattainably beautiful and perfect and true. If you look at Homer, the Odyssey, we think of that as just, that's a simple tale of epic adventure but it starts with Odysseus literally like weeping on a beach for his native homeland. He's gripped with longing and with homesickness. Mm, and it's, yeah. the understanding is that Potos is the, the catalyst that gets him on the epic adventure in the first place. And if you look at so many of our tales, they're all telling us the same thing. So extraordinary. And I think so many people feel this sense of exhaustion from the effort of remaining upbeat and positive all the time. And the idea that that's not only like a sort of um, a burden and a form of, 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 to some degree, like social fraudulence yes. <laughs> right, that we all yeah. engage in, but it's also cutting us off from a kind of experience of the beautiful and experience of empathy. To me, this book feels like the most kind of natural and perfect sequel to Quiet that I, that I can imagine. Uh, I, I mean, to me, it has a lot of parallels. Do, do you feel that way? Well, it's so funny because I think it ended up having a lot of parallels, but I had no idea of that when I started it. You know, I felt like I was off in this completely new direction. I mean, I thought it had in common that it was also a work of non nonfiction and, um, <laughs> you know, and written with my sensibility, same, same author. But yeah, it was only as I was going along that I realized that it was also talking about a state of being that is undervalued in our culture and that it's the kind of unearthing of a hidden superpower that we hadn't realized was there. So I, I think that's what the book is, but I didn't set out with that framework. Quiet in my mind, which had you know such an enormous impact, gave people permission on some level to inhabit without apology, a kind of non-mainstream personality type. And now bittersweet is giving us permission to have this kind of non-normative worldview. Though most people who know me have rejected any claims I've ever made to having an introverted side. <laughs> um, I think most would, would, would see me as, as bittersweet. So therefore, yeah, I can I'm, see that. I'm, I'm now included in, the <laughs> in those being emancipated uh, this time around. <laughs> um, but, it, it's, but what's amazing to me is that in both cases, you've done this partly through, I, I think both books are part memoir, you know, and, and not memoir because I think you wanted to particularly tell your story, but more memoir because you saw that kind of stripping yourself down and sharing deeply personal experiences was a necessary part of the process of getting the reader to develop the kind of trust and courage to do the same thing themselves. Yeah, I think it's partly that. And it's also something you and I have talked about before. I had had on my website, the observation that one of my favorite moments in life is when 
an author or artist expresses something that you've always felt, but never mm. quite articulated before. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that's yeah. just one of, yeah, that, that's just one of the great wondrous things that happens when you're alive, when you have those moments. And I think it's why I became a writer in the first place, because it was so inspiring. So I always feel like because of that, you know, when you're writing a book, you, you kind of have to do that. You have to... I call it telling the truth of what it's like to be alive because that's why people are reading. They're, they're, they're kind of counting on you to open up in that way. I don't mean in a confessional way so much, but like in a really telling the truth kind of way. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, no, it's, it, it's so, so powerful. And again, I, I went through, um, quite a few boxes of Kleenex, <laughs> but good tears, you know, and just, and, and pleasurable tears, you know, um, well, Susan, why, uh, let's start with music, if we can, because mm -hmm. I think music is to some degree where this started for you, you know, where, where you found yourself connecting in a pleasurable way to, to sadness um, and longing. And, and it's also where you discovered that this was not necessarily considered to be normal by everybody, um, at least for a, a law student. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, just like anybody else, I, I don't like the state of sadness. I don't like being sad. No one likes being sad, just to be clear about that. But as you say, this book started for me with a question, well, with an experience that I kept having. So before I became a writer, I was a lawyer for almost 10 years, mm -hmm. very improbably. So in my first year of law school, some friends were coming to pick me up to go to class. They were coming to my dorm. And I, as I characteristically do, was listening to some kind of minor key music. It was probably Leonard Cohen, and it was blasting for my speakers. And one of my friends asked me, why are you listening to funeral tunes? And at the time, I just kind of laughed and we went off to class and that was the end of the story, except that I couldn't stop thinking about that comment, like I, about the fact of why it is that listening to this kind of music is seen as something to joke about or even vaguely embarrassing. Like You wouldn't normally be blasting it out, I guess. But also what it is about that music that I love so much. Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure this out. Like, why would something so ostensibly sad actually be happy making? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and for me, as I dug down, like I, I realized that it's the willingness and the ability of a musician to turn pain into beauty um, is such an awesome action. And also there's a kind of sense of communion that, the music is expressing sorrow in a way that we've all experienced. So there's a kind of communion that you have and listening to it. And I started researching it and finding that people listen to the happy songs on their playlists 175 times, but they listen to the sad songs 800 times. I love that sad. Yeah, it's amazing. I know. It's crazy. And they tell researchers that the music makes them feel a sense of wonder and awe and transcendence. Researchers call it the sublime emotions. Mm -hmm. So at first, all I really wanted to do is answer this question about what philosophers call the paradox of tragedy. You know, like, why would we engage with art forms that should make us sad? But what I started to realize is that these art forms are part of this, these centuries of wisdom traditions and artistic traditions that all contain this message to us that these states of longing that we feel for a more perfect and beautiful world than the one that we have, that is like the fundamental state of the human soul. And for some people it's expressed religiously in explicit religious terms. And for some people it's metaphorical, but that that is fundamentally who we are. And it's also the wellspring of our best natures. It may not always be happy, but it is one of, it's our creative wellspring and it's one of our deepest wellsprings of connection with each other. Well, and, and the, the power of that, of that connection is so beautifully demonstrated in the story that you open the book with, the cellist from Sarajevo. Can you share that story? Yeah, sure. So in, I think it was 1992, there was the, the famous siege of Sarajevo. Um, 
in which there were literally like it was a civil war and there were snipers on the hills of this beautiful city. Historically, this had been a city in which three different peoples, um, it was Muslims and Croats and Eastern Orthodox, had been living together in more or less harmony for quite some time. But, but then suddenly it broke out into civil war and people, like the people of the city, literally couldn't leave their homes without risking their lives because there were snipers up on the hills and there were bombings and so on. And one day there was a bombing of a bakery in the middle of the city. And a man named Vedran Smilovich had been near that bombing and he took care of the wounded, helped, helped to take care of the wounded. And then he came back the next day to the scene of the bombing and he was the lead cellist of the Sarajevo Orchestra. And he came back and he was dressed up in his concert tails, like in, in mm -hmm. a tuxedo and so on. And he, and he plopped a chair down right in, this, in the middle of all this wreckage and carnage and rubble. And he took out his cello and he played the Albinoni in G minor, which most people listening, they may not know what it is, but when, if, if they hear it, they'll recognize it. And it's just the most hauntingly beautiful music you can imagine. And people said to him, you know, how could you do this? How could you sit out and, and expose yourself to all this risk? You know, you, you're going to be shot any moment. And he said, you asked me if I'm crazy to be doing this. You should ask them, are they crazy to be bombing the city? But he plays this haunting music every day for 22 days out in the open. Wow. One day for each of the 22 people who had been killed by the bombing. And there's something about that music and its yearning, haunting, minor key nature that expresses better than anything else could the fact that this is on the surface a city of combatants or victims of combatants but it's really a city of people aching for love and that's what he's saying with that music And, and by the way, we are now seeing all kinds of echoes of that in Ukraine with, with musicians. I, I'm guessing many of them are consciously aware of following Smilovich's example because it became so iconic. That's right. I texted you. You may have already seen it, this incredible article about this violinist in Kiev, a conservatory st student named Ilya Bondarenko, who partnered with a violinist in Los Angeles to create what they called a violin flash mob. They created a video that opens uh, with Ilya performing a Ukrainian folk song in a basement shelter in mm -hmm. Kiev. And then he's gradually joined by more and more violinists around the world. It's just... So, so powerful. And it's amazing to me that that's a, a Ukrainian folk song. What I hear listening is, we are all mortal, we're all going to die. But before then, we have this time together and it's beautiful. And let's connect. I mean, it's just this sort of incredibly visceral human kind of cry. Exactly, exactly. That's what that music is saying. There's something about this human impulse, as I say, to, to transform pain into beauty. And music happens to be one of the best media that we have for doing that. But that's what we're hearing in those moments. And that's what the artists are doing, whether they're, they're thinking of it consciously that way or not. That song on YouTube has raised twenty-four thousand dollars for a UN relief fund for refugees. So it seems to be working. I made a donation this morning after listening to it. Just, um, but so there's something about certain kinds of music. I think music in minor keys that evokes this sense of, of communion, connection, sadness. We're all together in the same human plight. And apparently, Susan, you're not the only one who likes this music, <laughs> right? As you pointed out, like people play these sad songs, it, more than happy songs. In, in all cultures, we have these beloved musical genres. 
Spanish flamenco, Portuguese fado, Irish lament, right? The American blues. And, and you also point out that the lullabies we sing to our kids are in minor keys. And that was a Ukrainian folk song. You know, so it's interesting that this is in all areas of music, we, we have this kind of connection. Yeah, it's such an interesting thing. I mean, the the poet Federico Garcia Lorca actually, tra- he, he was Spanish, and he traveled around Spain collecting the country's lullabies and concluded at the end that we, I, I don't have the exact quote at my fingertips, but basically that we, the nation uses its saddest melodies to lull its our children to sleep. And why do we do that? It's a very interesting question. I mean, I, I have theories about what it is. Um, I do think it's because we all of us enter the world with this sense that the beautiful world that we belong in is now out of reach. You know, you, mm. you kind of come into this world with a sense of spiritual banishment, but also spiritual longing for home. And, yeah. and that's what the music is telling us. And that's why we're singing it to our babies. Yeah, yeah. No, it's sort of a calling, calling us home and home. I think of uh, summer camp where I listen to taps, you know, day mm. is done, right. the sun. Every night that'd be play, it would be played on a, on a trumpet. And it was beautiful and, and, and mournful, and, and, but somehow calling me to sleep, <laughs> you know, which was yeah. home, which was, which was sort of this place of, of stillness, you know. That's such a great example. I had that exact experience, but I had never thought of that before. Yeah. And I do want to say, by the way, just yeah. for people listening, like, um, I love dance music too. I'm sure you do also. Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so absolutely. we're not saying this is the only kind of music. It's more just talking about what this strand of artistic expression and of emotional life means, because we don't usually shine enough of a spotlight on it. Next podcast, we'll, we'll, we'll hit the dance tunes and, and the hip hop and the, um, you know, you, so you mentioned Garcia Lorca, who I think was Leonard Cohen's favorite poet. I, of course, I learned this from your book. Um, oh, good man. You really read it. That was like one line. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and I guess, I guess Cohen said that, that he'd learned from Garcia Lorca, uh, that he was quote, this aching creature in the midst of an aching cosmos. And the ache was okay. Not only was it okay, but it was the way you embraced the sun and the moon. Uh, It was just such a powerful sequence of sentences. Yeah, isn't that just the best quote ever? Um, And Leonard Cohen said that in response to Garcia Lorca's observation about this longing that that you and I are trying to talk about. And, And Garcia Lorca called it, quote, the mysterious power which everyone senses and no philosopher explains. Mm. I have to say, I, I felt better when I read that quote because part of the reason it took me so long to write this book is is uh, it was like an exercise in trying to put into words something that is by its nature ineffable. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And you dedicate the book to Leonard Cohen. Mm-hmm. who was almost like a friend to you growing up, it sounds like, right? I, I mean, I mean it, just through his music, it, it's, it's played a real role in your life. I think we have a, a, a clip from Suzanne. Suzanne takes you down to her place near the river. What does that evoke for you? Oh, my gosh. Well, uh, so I had loved loved him and his music for so many years, as you say, I had never really thought about why it was or like what, what exactly he was saying. I, but then when he died and also when I started writing this book and found myself speaking of him so much and dedicating it to him, I, I went deeper into his biography. The epigraph to this book, one of the epigraphs is his and it goes, there is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. And you want to travel blind. That idea comes from the Kabbalah, which is the mystical side of Judaism that he had been influenced by quite heavily. And the idea there is that there's a kind of metaphor that all of creation 
had originally been a single and intact divine vessel, but then the vessel shattered. So what we're living in now is the world of brokenness, but equally a world of beauty. And so we're living with these divine shards from this vessel kind of scattered all around us um, in the mud. And one of the things that we can do in our lives is pick up the shards where we find them. And the shards that you notice are going to be completely different from the ones that I notice and pick up, but we can all see them. And I realized, oh my gosh, you know, that philosophy, I, I found it mm. so deeply comforting and inspiring. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's what he's been saying all these years in his music. And I think it is really useful for all of us to think of who are the artists or entrepreneurs or whatever, like that, who are, who are the figures in our lives who we love with a kind of crazy outsized love. And, and then to take this next question of asking, what do those people represent to me? Like what, why, why do I love this person the way I do? There, I, mm-hmm. There's usually an extra truth, I think, buried in the answer to that question. Mm, yeah. I just, I just love that notion of the shards of beauty being scattered all around us in the mud, because it also sort of dignifies our just little daily recognitions of beauty and daily connections with each other, opposed to living in this way that, oh, everything has to, you know, uh, be building to this climactic sudden moment of meaning, that, that it's this daily process of, of observance and, and, and connection and love. Yeah, absolutely. And that like, I don't know, like, you know, as you say this, I'm looking out my window and there's a tree and it's, you could say it's just a tree, but it's also like a freaking miracle that there's a tree out there. <laughs> you know what I mean? And when, yeah, and when yeah. you look at life in, uh, through that lens, you, you see it quite differently. Absolutely. But we're particularly after living in New York City for a decade or two, right? <laughs> <laughs> the tree really looks like a miracle. Um, you know, this, this, uh, so, so again, uh, that we're, we're aching creatures in the midst of an aching cosmos. What are we aching for? Yeah, we're aching for communion with each other. Uh, I believe we're aching for a world in which the lions actually do lay down with the lambs, you know, where that's not Mm. just something we say, but it's actually true. Um, You know, a world that is truly kind and without cruelty, Um, a world in which life doesn't have to eat life in order to survive, Uh, you know, a, a world beyond anything that we experience but I think we're aching for all of it. I'm Jesse Hempel, host of Hello Monday. In my 20s, I knew what I wanted for my career. But from where I am now, in the middle of my life, nothing feels as certain. Work's changing, we're changing, and there's no guidebook for how to make sense of any of it. So every Monday, I bring you conversations with people who are thinking deeply about work and where it fits into our lives. We talk about making career pivots, about purpose and how to discern it, about where happiness fits into the mix and how to ask for more money. Come join us in the Hello Monday community. Let's figure out the future together. Listen to Hello Monday with Jesse Hempel wherever you get your podcasts. Hey folks, Rufus here. If you're a fan of our interviews with physicians, scientists, or entrepreneurs, then I have the perfect podcast recommendation for you, Raising Health. Previously called BioEats World, Raising Health comes from leading venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, A16Z. Each episode, Raising Health dives deep into the heart of healthcare, biotech, and AI with A16Z general partners. Along the way, they explore the real challenges and opportunities in health and biotech entrepreneurship. Not to mention, you'll hear raw insights and actionable advice from notable guests like Omada CEO and co-founder Sean Duffy, and AI expert and in Citro CEO Daphne Kohler. Don't miss out. Follow Raising Health wherever you get your podcasts. I love this this observation uh, that the Portuguese have this concept of saudade. I don't know if I'm saying that. Saudade, correctly. yes. Saudade, saudade. thank you. Yeah. Saudade, a quote sweetly piercing nostalgia, um, often expressed musically, for something deeply cherished, long gone, that may never have existed in the first place. 
Yeah, exactly. Right? That, that I thought was extraordinary. <laughs> I, it is so extraordinary. And the amazing thing, I don't know if you've ever been to Lisbon, um, which... Never. I'd like oh to go. Oh my gosh, you've yeah. got to go. I, I love that city so much. Oh, um, wow. So they're so into their concept of Sodade. Like they name their pastry shop Sodade. It's yeah. like everywhere, everywhere you see that concept in the city. Um, and, and, and this comes from the fact that, you know, this is a city on an ocean and historically the men would go out to sea and... There was a sense of, will they come back or won't they come back? So there was, you know, Fado was partly an expression of the longing of those who had been left behind, longing for their seafarers to come home. Um, but then, of course, it exists on a, a more metaphysical uh, plane as well. But yeah, you can hear it in, in all of the music. And then you see that in Brazil, too. Brazilians have the concept of sodaje, same thing. You, you hear it in Brazilian music. She got you. All of these different cultures are all really expressing the same thing. And it's a, it's a sense of longing for the unattainable. You know, you mentioned romantic love. I think that's a really useful thing for us to know about ourselves when we enter our love relationships, romantic relationships, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because what happens is, you know, especially during the early moments of romance, romances, you feel for a moment in time that you've actually gotten to that place that all humans long for. And then reality sets in and you have whatever incompatibilities you have that, that happen in all couples. And if you're not like aware of these dynamics, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. can think that means there's something wrong with this relationship and you should go to the next one where Eden will be over there. Okay. This, mm -hmm. this was a false garden of Eden. I'm going to go to the real one now instead of understanding that this is the condition. And, and over the course of a, a of a given relationship, you're going to keep having those moments where, where Eden approaches. Um, but to understand that the feeling of it falling away and then coming closer again and then falling away and then coming closer again. That's, that's a normal state for humans. Yeah. No, in my experience, I think it may last three to six months. <laughs> that, <laughs> that experience of, but yes, absolutely. That, that it, it's so critical to, to see that sort of the totality of it. And this is the human condition on some level. I love this observation in the book. You cite a study of 50,000 Norwegians who uh, expose themselves to creativity, um, whether as a creator or consumer, just going to museums and so on, that showed that exposure to art, whether it's creation of art or just exposure to art, results in greater health, life satisfaction, lower rates of anxiety and depression. And I mentioned this because this, this can start to sound like, oh, this is a very sentimental expression of a, of a desire for, you know, a certain kind of, a certain kind of emotional, uh, experience. But in fact, I think there's a fair amount of evidence that there's real utility to inhabiting this kind of artistic sensibility, right? It, it, it helps us be more appreciative, have more transcendent experiences, but also just fundamentally be more grounded and happier. Yeah. There's something about, you know, you hear the word beauty and you're like, okay, well, that's nice. We think of it as adornment or decoration as opposed to something that is fundamental. And I thought that study was really, really interesting because it validates an experience that many of us have had. You know, during the pandemic, I'd fallen into a habit of waking up in the morning and doom scrolling, as mm -hmm. I guess many people do. Yeah. And I decided I needed to do something about it. And I start I I, I asked people to tell me their favorite art accounts that they followed on Twitter. And I started following those people and more and more and more of them. And before I knew it, my whole feed was full of art. Mm, wow. And then I start, yeah, yeah. And then I started this daily practice of sharing my favorite art on my social channels. And I would often take the time to pair it with a favorite poem or quote or idea. And it would sometimes take me like an hour to do this before I would start writing every morning. But it was such an amazing daily practice. And so when I came across that study, I thought, oh, okay, that's that's why this makes sense to do. Yeah, I love that. And that's and that's a really practical kind of tip for for all of us, right? That that 
you know, I, I mean, I, I've always been struck that it, I've always thought, well, it's kind of clever that these sort of hedge fund managers are able to make money when the market's going down and when it's going up by selling short or whatever. And I've always thought artists do this with experience, yes. you know, right. That you can actually generate joy and beauty from painful experiences and loss. And that is a hack that, that I mean, to be sort of very pragmatic about it, that we all need, right? And, and, and that, that there's a real, that, and I think this is part of the core message of your book that I yeah. took away anyway, which is that really this, that this is fundamentally an artistic sensibility that is not just for the artists, unless you want to say that we're all artists, that, that to be human is to be an artist, is to be an appreciator of, of beauty, of that which is within reach, but also that which is not within reach, that that is where a huge amount of the satisfaction of the human experience lies. And that, it, and, and that really everybody can benefit from embracing this sensibility. Absolutely. I mean, I, I actually say in the book, you know, whatever pain you can't get rid of, make that your creative offering. There, there's been this debate in recent years over is creativity associated with depression, isn't it? Yeah. And, and I yeah. think that's actually really the wrong debate to be having because the idea is not that creativity is is pain. It's that creativity is a power that we can use when we're confronted with pain to turn it into something else. And there are actually really interesting studies about this. Like there was one that I wrote about where the researchers took this group of people and they split them into two groups unbeknownst to them. And one group was asked to give a speech, but unbeknownst to them, the audience was primed to respond to the speech with like a lot of disapproval and bored expressions on their faces and lackluster applause at the end. Um, and the other group got an audience that responded with lots of cheers and approbation. And, and just as you would expect, the people who gave the speeches to the disapproving audiences felt pretty down afterwards, and the other group felt pretty happy. Then the researchers asked these people who had just given the speeches to make a collage, which they had a, a panel of artists rate for creativity. And they found that the group who had given the speeches to the disapproving audiences created better collages and that that was especially true for those who had come in with um, a hormonal profile that showed that they had a tendency to emotional vulnerability. Wow. That's so cool. And, and it overlaps in beautiful ways with, with Dan Pink's research around regret, doesn't it? I mean, you know, that, that there's utility to these feelings. Yeah, absolutely. And that you kind of have a choice when you have these feelings, you know, of like, are you going to sort of disavow them and then you end up taking them out later on yourself or on somebody else or is there some kind of a way to transform them and I, I i don't mean to say that in a way to like put further pressure on somebody who's going through a painful experience like yeah not only do you yeah. have this pain but now you should turn it into the next ninth symphony like i i don't mean it mm -hmm. like that and and the act of transformation doesn't have to be public or grand or anything it could be you know baking a cake it could it could be whatever it is right well, well this this is a line from your book sad moods tend to sharpen our attention they make us more focused and detail oriented they improve our memories correct our cognitive biases there's kind of real real utility to these sad moods what one, one of the most extraordinary um, studies to me in the book was of 1400 letters written by Mozart, Liszt, and Beethoven throughout their lives, just tracking the words in the letters, right? And, and, and to see when they were using, you know, uh, talking about happiness or, or grief to track, you know, this, the frame of minds that the artists were in. And the conclusion was that the quantity and quality of the music they composed was directly correlated with mood and basically sadder, less happy mood resulted in better creative output. I know. It's kind of astonishing, right? And I think that study was done by an economist. It was such a, it was such an interesting <laughs> use of an economist's <laughs> yeah. tools. <laughs> Absolutely. So as I mentioned earlier, Susan, I, I took the bittersweet survey. I scored off the charts. I was not surprised by that. <laughs> but when I was asked the question, do you tend to see 
happiness and sadness and things all at once. I, I first put 10 out of 10 because yeah, I, I, I love that kind of aching relationship to beauty. But then I, 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 I reduced my score on that one because what I realized was that there are times, let's say, when I'm playing with my kids mm -hmm. um, or even with, with good friends, you know, spending time where I'll sometimes pull back and experience nostalgia for the present moment if that makes sense. Sure. Right? <laughs> like this sense that like, this is so beautiful and special and it won't last forever. And so now in this moment, I'm looking at this current moment from through an inch of glass. And that's beautiful in the sense that it's, a, it's an act of appreciation, but it also distances me from presence, you know, in that moment. Is that a, something that you've experienced? Well, that's interesting. I feel like what you're talking about is the difference between being fully present in the moment versus using a cognitive tool to make you appreciate that moment more. And that, yeah, there's a place for those tools, but you don't always want to be using them. But I would say that there are moments where that kind of joint awareness just happens to us spontaneously. Like, so we are yes. fully present, but it still happens. And you know, you know, that's happening because anytime you tear up at something mm -hmm. that you find incredibly beautiful, I think that's a moment where you're fully present and it's happening. Yes. I think, I, I do think that's right. I guess, you know, and you address this in the book, I guess there's sort of this question of how much we should long for, you know, I, I mean, is there such a thing as too much longing? There could almost be a uh, a, a, a melodramatic impulse, which I feel in myself. <laughs> you know? um, but sometimes I, 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 my response to myself and my internal dialogue is, Rufus, <laughs> maybe let's just want less. <laughs> and and uh, including, and I'm not talking about things here, I'm talking about experiences and connection and all those things, you know. Well, it's interesting you say that because one question I really haven't answered yet is, um, okay, I believe we need to be making, especially in mainstream psychology, there needs to be a distinction between melancholy and depression, which you won't find right now. Like mm, if you yeah. Right now, if you type melancholy into PubMed, let's say, you're going to get back a whole bunch of articles about clinical depression. So, you know, this whole artistic and series of wisdom traditions that we have that talk about all this stuff about longing and melancholy, you don't really find it reflected in mainstream psychology. So on the one hand, we do need to make that distinction. What, what I really don't have the answer to, though, is whether it is a distinction of kind or a distinction of degree. I'm not sure. Mm. It may be that it's a distinction of degree, you know, that a certain amount of these kinds of emotions and states of being do give us access to higher states of creativity, connection, awe, wonder, all of that. But that when you have too much of it, you get pulled into the emotional black hole of depression. That's possible. Or it may be that they're totally different. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I, th there's probably some Goldilocks zone. <laughs> of, yeah. of, you know, I mean, I've, I, I've always been sort of torn between the ironic sort of view and, and and the literal or the artistic temperament and the and the and the more practical business temperament yeah, I've always sort of had, had a had a foot in both in both of those worlds and um, I've always and, and I've often had two groups of friends <laughs> right who, yeah, who, who were, yeah who were more some of whom were just sort of entirely inhabiting uh, a, a kind of uh, artistic sensibility all the time, and others of whom were always in this in this literal world of gears and cogs, and you know, and fascinated with the machinery of the world. And and I I've always sort of felt like, well, I'm really interested in both, <laughs> you know, and and I'm not sure I can handle only having one of those points of view. That's really interesting, and it's funny you were talking about Dan Pink's book about regret. And one of the questions I ask myself all the time is, do I regret, should I regret all those years that I spent as a corporate lawyer before doing the thing I really wanted to do? And in the end, I just can't get myself to regret it. And part of the reason for that is that I think if I had followed, like, if I had followed my artistic side from the beginning, 
I don't know, I feel like I could have spun out into a world of unreality in a certain way and and spending all those years in the world of quantification and practicality. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I feel like it was good for me, even if it wasn't where I truly belonged. Well, Susan, to me, the most moving parts of your book were the parts about your own personal journey. And I know that's some of it is still kind of raw. And and I I was absolutely, um, if we were to have a, a, a tissue index <laughs> on my on my lacrimal response to your book, it really was off the charts with with, with the story specifically of like you and, and your mother. If you don't mind, I might read a passage from that section. Sure, sure. You wrote, she was still my mother and I wanted desperately more than I've ever wanted anything before or since to fill the chasm inside her, to take away her hurt. I couldn't think of my mother's tears, which I often caused without crying myself. As the youngest child, I mattered so much to her. I mattered too much. I mattered like the sun. To grow up was to condemn her to darkness. It was just <laughs> so affecting. And you were kind of presented with a, with a choice to be loved unconditionally or become your own person. And it was kind of not a real choice because you had to become your own person. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my mother and I went through like a very, very extreme version of, I guess, what often happens when children grow up and separate from their parents. For us, it was just very extreme. And I I think I might leave it to um, listeners who are curious to read about that because I think I yeah, probably sure. wrote about it better than I might be able to express it all right now, um, other than to yeah. say that that I share that story in part because, I don't know, I guess for a lot of reasons, you know, to, to well, in, in a book about, uh, oh gosh, Rufus, I'm really bad at talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries, no worries. It is beautifully expressed in the book and, and listeners will hopefully have, have the chance to to read it. And I, I love the detail, Susan, that you say, when I got back to campus, you signed up for a creative writing class and you wrote about that, I wrote a story about this. And the professor, who was a seasoned novelist, said gruffly, put it in a drawer and don't take it out again for 30 years. You're too close to the material. <laughs> <laughs> and you said the professor was right, but that was over 30 years ago. Yeah, so that's right. It, it, it took you 30 years to process the experience and be able to write about it. And writing about uh, these kinds of you know painful human experiences is very empowering. And that's something that you talk about as a, as a tool that, that we, we can all write about our most painful experiences and get a lot of relief from that process. Yeah, absolutely. So this is something I had just been doing naturally my whole life. I'd been keeping diaries and diaries <laughs> play a very central role in the story that I wrote about my mother and me. But it was many, many years later that I came across the work of the UT professor, James Pennebaker, who's done this like astonishing series of studies showing the benefits of the simple act of mm -hmm. just writing down your troubles. Um, you know, and he's done all these studies where he'll compare one group of people who are asked to write what they had for breakfast that morning. And then the other group is asked to write about the things that are bothering them. And I want to stress, they're not asked to write it in any especially beautiful or poetic or grammatical way. They just have to like splat it down on the piece of paper and then throw it away afterwards. That's it. And he found that the simple act of doing that improves your health. Um, it improves your sense of well-being. It improves your capabilities at work. Like there was one study where he had this group of, of 50 something laid off engineers who were very despondent and hadn't been able to find new work. And half of them were asked to write things, write down their troubles. And the ones who did were much more likely to have found work several months later, and they had lower blood pressure and all kinds of other indicators. You kind of it's can't believe it. Yeah. So um, that's a really simple daily practice that we all could be doing. You know, it would take three minutes every morning. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I've been trying, Susan, for 
30 some years. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I get in modes where I'll do five days in a row and then I forget about it for a couple months. But I, um, but it, it is such a great practice and it's much cheaper than therapy, uh, which is also <laughs> a great thing. So we, Yeah, and a lot um, less time consuming too. Most ideas bounce off us, but some actually change us. If you want more of those ideas in your life, there's no better place to find them than the Next Big Idea app. We partnered with hundreds of the world's leading nonfiction authors to create audio summaries of their books. We call these summaries Book Bites, and our app features a new one every single day. You can listen to a book bite in 12 minutes or read it in five. There's no other place on the planet where you can listen to book summaries created by the authors themselves. And that's not all we have waiting for you when you download the Next Big Idea app. We've also got professionally narrated summaries of classic books, video and audio masterclasses, ad-free versions of this podcast, and tons of other member benefits. So what are you waiting for? Pause this recording, open your app store, and search for the next big idea. There is no better way to get smart fast. Download the next big idea app right now. to accentuate the positive it to negative light well let's talk a little bit about our american sensibility right because so much of this what we're talking about exists in contrast or in in, in attention with our prevailing culture because we live in this uh, in this culture in which we're all expected to smile all the time and have an upbeat can do attitude and you went kind of deep into trying to understand where that came from. That was such an interesting section of the book. And and do you want to share that? Yeah, I was really curious where it all was from. And um, so there is this strain in our culture through the 19th century, we became increasingly a society oriented around business and being successful at business. Um, but at yeah. the same time, throughout the 19th century, there was this ongoing series of economic booms followed by panics and busts. So, you know, people would grow quickly wealthy and then lose everything, or they would fail to have ever earned anything in the first place. And there became this question of like, when somebody failed at business, was it the product of outside circumstances? Or mm -hmm. was there something quote, in the man, you know, some, some, some quality that marked this person as a loser? And I use the word loser advisedly because that word changed meaning over time. You know, it started as just the expression of a person who has lost something, you know, like very matter of fact. But of course, now it's become a uh, loser is the, the most contemptible thing, the thing you absolutely don't want to be. And so e even in during the time of the depression, the economic depression in 1929, there were newspaper headlines that would say things like loser, you know, lost his fortune and commit suicide in the streets. And and so increasingly the answer became, if you had failed, it was because there was something wrong with you. And the more you think that, the more it becomes really important to take on the per persona and the emotional affect of somebody who appears to be predestined to win, right? Like if you're really cheerful and everything seems to be going your way, that marks you as a winner. Whereas if you're somebody who, <laughs> the way we're doing right now, if you're like sitting around for an hour talking about loss and melancholia, you know, maybe mm -hmm. that means that, no. that there's something wrong with you yes. that marks you out as a secret loser. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's where this uh, distaste that we all have comes from. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's so interesting. And it, and you know, this genre of, of self-help, which is, I think, a deeply American genre, right? Arguably traces back to Benjamin Franklin and maybe, maybe it goes earlier. I don't know, depending on how, how one looks at it, but a core part of the American sensibility is this pragmatism, right? And somehow in the self-help genre, uh, you know, you, you have these fascinating passages of the great psychologist, William James writing about how around the turn of the century, um, in his 1902 book, varieties of religious experience, that there was this kind of almost a movement to banish sorrow, 
he, he, he writes, complaints of the weather are forbidden in many households. And more and more people are recognizing it to be bad for him to speak about disagreeable sensations. The Boy Scouts trained its charges to, quote, look for the bright side of life, cheerfully do tasks that come your way. So this was really a, a kind of conscious decision that was um, expressed th in, in many, many, many books, advice books and so on, to just have a positive attitude and get things done and smile and, 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 and ignore your, your kind of uh, true feelings. And, and of course, we have seen studies that in some cases, this can be effective, right? I mean, there, there can be a utility to being intentional about changing one's mood in the service of trying to accomplish things. And so it, it, it strikes me, and I'm curious to hear what you think of this, that if you think of culture as like an algorithm, you know, there are different cultures running different algorithms, that this American culture that's focused on a kind of fraudulent positivity is effective at a very specific thing, which is advancing business and pragmatically moving forward to get things done. But it, it, it tends to block our, impede our ability to apprehend reality, appreciate beauty, be psychologically healthy, and connect with people on a deeper level. I think that was the most amazing encapsulation of what I was trying to say that I've heard. I, like, yes, I, I think that's exactly it. And, and it's not that there's no utility in each way of being. I mean, I, I'm mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. so fundamentally, at my heart, you know, a seeker of balance. So like, yeah, in arguing yeah. for this, I'm, I'm really just trying to correct an imbalance. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that there's no utility to trying to be actively positive and cheerful in certain circumstances, especially for the sake of people around you or for the sake of getting things done. There is utility in that for sure. It's just that we've done that to such a fault. Yes, we've oversteered. And, and also maybe these could be modalities that we we should learn as individuals to turn on and off to some degree, right? And and because uh, I, well, I found myself reading this section feeling very torn about whether I was sort of ready to to do away with this sort of American positivity or not, you know? Yeah, <laughs> and, yeah. And I've always loved the quote from E.B. White, I arise in the morning torn between the desire to improve or save the world and a <laughs> desire to enjoy or savor the world. This makes it hard to plan the day. <laughs> <laughs> but Susan, I feel like that's my life. It's like I totally I? see that in you. You're 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 like equal parts cockeyed optimist and bittersweet melancholic. Like that's it's, it's that hard to so. see which one is stronger in you. That, that I, I I I'm definitely sort of surfing <laughs> between those two sensibilities, and I feel like the faux positivity is part of the story of 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 Americanness that has had utility. But I, I, I certainly cannot live in that sensibility all the time. Yeah, no, it's a very, very tricky thing. Um, what you're making me think of, I did uh, not long ago, I gave a virtual talk to a group of um, executives at a company and the talk started as, you know, as it often does, there's like the little chat box and an organizer asked, how's everybody feeling this morning? You know, and all the answers were like pumped and thrilled and so happy to be here and, you know, all like that. And I thought to myself, what are the chances that this is a true representation of the emotional state of every member of this executive team right now? Like the chances are probably near zero. Yeah. Yeah. And so is it the right thing or is it not the right thing? I mean, I do think that there is a way of creating spaces for people to give a more true expression of what they're really feeling, far from it dragging other people down or interfering with the task. It can be a way of people coming together um, if it's handled correctly. You and I, Susan, read so many books uh, in, in this space. And it's interesting, interesting to see what studies are most cited. And one of the most cited studies, cited in literally like dozens and dozens of books, was the study um, that Google did called Project Aristotle, where they studied the effectiveness of different teams. And the most effective teams were those that shared personal challenges. And, and there was a particularly 
memorable example of a leader who was who had a cancer diagnosis and was you know was in the final years of his life and, and was and was candid about it and you know and, and so i think it's 100% right that it's not that I, so I, I'd like to rescind some of what I said previously, which is that it's not a it's it, it's not a zero sum game at all, right? There's no there's no need to be contained and, and and not and not emotionally connected. That project Aristotle study was absolutely fascinating, mm. and I would also say that we have another step to take with that because I was I was really struck as you were yeah. by the very moving story of the the manager who revealed his terminal diagnosis. And at the same time, what I also thought about is the way that certain kinds of griefs are okay to talk about in the office. And one of those is illness. But then there's this whole mm, other category yeah. that psychologists right. call disenfranchised griefs of uh, all the different losses that we have in an everyday life that are kind of socially unacceptable still to disclose. I've had to learn, I mean, just to be able to say, you know, honestly, I'm just kind of in a funk and and I'm not totally sure why. You know, that's interesting. So like when you say that, if you tell your coworkers, I'm, I'm in a funk, I'm not sure why, are you concerned about them? You know, they're they're like looking to you to steer the ship. So I could understand you feeling concerned about sharing that, that you wouldn't want to make them feel insecure of like, you know, maybe our leader is distracted right now. Yeah. By emotions. No, I, for better or for worse, Susan, I have fully abandoned any kind of um, veneer of uh, of perfection and invincibility with our team. <laughs> 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 We're now our, our our amazing team of nine people, the next big idea club. I I, I am happy to say that my, it's my experience anyway that everybody is really forthcoming and sincere, and we actually do share that kind of stuff. And it, it may be easier with a small team like we have, but it's been a beautiful a beautiful part of my life. And I, I hope that's true for others too. Oh, I'm sure it is. I'm sure it is. And I'm sure, you know, what happens over time is they've come to realize that you can talk about being in a funk and, and that's consistent still with running the company. Like those are not mutually exclusive states. And and yes. then the, the more they see that, the more they realize, oh, okay, that can coexist in all of us. And And this is something you point out in the book, which is that there is some evidence that people believe that leaders should be less vulnerable, right? I mean, there's certainly a perception that it's not okay to be a vulnerable leader. And hopefully that's beginning to change. Yeah, I do think it is. And uh, yeah, and there, there's talk about like management researchers look at different kinds of power that leaders have. And some leaders who might express themselves with more of you know, the traditional modes of expressing anger easily and projecting invincibility, that they're seen as having positional power, like the kind of power to to fire people and hire people. And then there's a different style of leadership that has more to do with quote, personal power, where the the team feels supportive of the leader, like the leader has their back and they have the leader's back. Mm, and they're just, exactly. they're just different styles yeah. of leadership. You know, one question that really interested me reading the book is this question, is this question that came up earlier really of like, is there a Goldilocks zone of sort of the optimal amount of longing, right? And it strikes me that some longing that we all experience today may be a result of poor design of how we live, you know? Um, and of course, one theme that's come up in so many of the books that have come out in recent years is that we have this loneliness epidemic, that so many people today feel isolated and alone. And one of the things that I've been fascinated by is like, and I'm interested in being involved in to some degree in the second half of my life, is are there ways we can design how we all live together that result in, in people being more connected and experiencing more love and less loneliness? And it feels to me like there's a little bit of a design flaw in the world right now, and that maybe longing is exaggerated for some portion of the population because people are too isolated. If we live more communally, we might feel longing a little bit less often. <laughs> is that, do you think there might be something to that? Well, I guess where I take that is that we need more truth telling with each other. We'd probably be healthier if we first started by just telling each other stuff and listening to each other more. 
Absolutely. And actually, I think, I think maybe the, the case that you would make as well is that it is through more honesty and more bittersweet communication that we do connect more meaningfully and more powerfully, right? And th this is the process through which we, um, you know, uh, we come together. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's not to, I, I, and I, again, I'm not saying that we need to speak this way and in this style and this dimension 24 seven. It's just that right now it's kind of limited to musical concerts and sometimes church on Sundays. And I, I, I just think we need to open up this field of discourse and, and a lot of people would feel less alone. And I will tell you that already, you know, from early readers of this book, mm. just like with quiet, the word that I keep hearing again and again is the word permission. Mm, yeah, yeah like, absolutely. Finally, I have permission to express what I have always felt all this time, but could never say. Mm. What you just said reminds me of what I felt for years, which is I, I grew up in a very religious household and I, uh, I, I decided that I was not religious at a relatively young age. And I felt a little bit of a sense of loss there for a long, long time. And, and I've, I, I felt that we need a, a secular church of some kind, you know, a, a place where we can talk about things that matter and, and sort of celebrate humanity and, and connection together. Maybe there's something to that, right? That a lot of people have, have, have lost some of these rituals that, that used to be places of this kind of connection. Yeah. It's funny you say, I'm, I'm actually writing about that right now. Like, I think that, um, you know, First, we we had a religious culture, but now all the statistics are showing us that people that many people are are falling away from traditional religion, but they're also moving away from traditional secular humanism, and it's kind of unclear what's next. And I think we all have to figure out what's next. Well, hopefully, uh, we'll figure it out. Having read your beautiful book, Bittersweet, because I think I think that will that will help. Uh, with creating a wise and, uh, and, and, and beautiful version of, of what's coming next. Susan, thank you so much for taking the time this morning. It's just uh, wonderful to talk with you about this. Thank you so, so much, Rufus. It is always a joy to talk to you. Nothing bittersweet about it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it was really great to be here. Susan Cain's new book is Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole. The next box delivered to hardback subscribers of the Next Big Idea Club will contain Bittersweet, as well as curator Dan Pink's new book, The Power of Regret. This means that members will have the privilege of connecting with Susan and Dan and enjoying an e-course she's creating based on the book. Join us at nextbigideaclub.com. How bittersweet are you? Go to SusanCain.net to take the bittersweet quiz. It only takes three minutes. This episode featured music by Yo-Yo Ma, Leonard Cohen, Georgie Benjor, and the Buglers of the United States Army Band. If you'd like to hear more bittersweet music, check out the playlist Susan posted on her website. Thank you, Susan Cain, for this conversation and for all that you do for the Next Big Idea Club and for all of us more broadly. Thank you, Liz Canner, for being my first love and for breaking my heart sophomore year of college. If you like this show, please leave us a rating and a review. I know it takes a bit of doing, but we really appreciate it. It's one of the best ways we have to get the word out about this show. Follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, the Next Big Idea app, or wherever you're listening right now. This episode was produced by Caleb Bissinger. Did you like the way the music flowed in and out of the episode? That was Caleb, with help from Mike Toda, our sound designer. Our executive producer is Michael Kovnat. Working with LinkedIn makes us whole. I'm your host, Rufus Griscom. See you next week.